right, so let's go ahead and take a look at the forces exam rubric here just real briefly, even though this is really meant to be a video about um, our, our forces exam sample test, just so you have a really, really high comfort level for the actual exam. Um, and, this, and this really is, like I was talking about in class, if I had, I've got four sections of physics, if I had a fifth section of physics, this would be one of the, one of the tests. So it will be almost identical to all the rest of the tests. Um, the only difference is that the values will change and they're not even gonna change that much. So I really, really, really wanna make sure that you feel like you're, you're super comfortable for this exam. All right, so I recommend just taking a look through the rubric um, real briefly on your, on your own at some point, just so that you have an idea as to what it will, um, what it'll look like. All right, so on the um, day of the exam, so next, uh, next class, you'll actually have this, this rubric um, up on the, on the overhead, so you can, or on the album, so you can actually look at it as you're, as you're doing it. Um, you will have these forces here, so you don't have to like memorize them or, or anything like that. Um, you should already be pretty comfortable with what the forces are. Right, so the normal force, right, that's the force that um, comes from a surface. So if this was a, a surface, the normal force is always going to be 90 degrees to that surface. So our arrow would be pointing up. Arrow, of course, representing the force. Force of gravity, hopefully pretty self-explanatory. FA was our applied force. FF, the force of friction. Remember, the force of friction is always a resisting force. So if we had an object that was going this way, uh, with our applied force or maybe a force of tension or so something else that's, that's pulling the object or pushing the object to the right just like this, um, the force of friction would be in the reverse direction uh, always. It will never be in the same direction as your applied force. Um, the F air, or what looks like fair there, uh, is just a, uh, essentially the, the force of friction but when we're moving through through air. So if you had somebody that was like parachuting or something like that as they're as they're dropping from their uh, parachute, as we'll see in, in one of the problems here, is a terrible, crappy drawing of mine here. But um, as they're as they're sort of dropping down, um, the force of gravity is going to be pulling them down, and we would have our force of air resistance pushing them uh, up, or actually, I guess, resisting them up, not really pushing them up, right? Um, F of lift. That's something that we haven't talked a ton about, um, which is why I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in, in just, a, just a bit as we're going through some of these problems. It's just the, um, the, the lift that like an airplane would experience. So let's say we had an airplane. Here's our, our tail. So it looks more like a turd with wings, but um, the F lift would be going this way. That's our, our lift force. Force of gravity would be pulling this guy down. And we'd still have some sort of uh, maybe applied force from the engines, and then the way uh, the way back here, this would be some air resistance, or you might call it uh, drag as well. F drag would also be acceptable, which is what this this last one was. So you can kind of use air resistance and drag fairly interchangeably. Just totally up to you which one uh, which one you prefer. All right, so the formulas that'll be on the test um, are, are right there. Again, this will be up on the on the Elmo, so you don't have to worry about memorizing them or anything like that. And you also get a, a half sheet um, note card. So anything from this video, any of the uh, problems that you will see me go through, anything from the answer key, you're welcome to copy down directly onto that uh, note sheet and, and use that for the exam. Uh, but these will be given to you. All right, gravity we know is technically negative 10 meters per second squared. Remember, meters per second squared always represents an acceleration. Or, of course, we could just uh, represent it with A alone, um, or G, since it's just a, a special type of acceleration coming from, coming from gravity. Uh, technically, it's negative 9.8 meters a second squared, but we go with negative 10 just to make rounding a little bit easier. Even if you were taking AP1, you would also go with negative 10 um, just because it's really, really close to negative 9.8 and makes the math a little bit easier for us um, to, to handle since we're really not focused on the math so much as we are the, the physics. Typically, you're not going to really need this uh, formula in the in the middle so much. I gave it to you because it is the other formula that we were using in this um, in this particular unit. You may end up using it for the multiple choice questions, but you won't on the, uh, on the free response at all. So that leaves us with just F net equals ma, which is Newton's second law. All right, so just as a really brief review before we get going here, um, 
there's three laws that Newton came up with. Um, <laughs> some students in the past said like he invented them. Uh, he definitely didn't. He discovered them. But um, Newton's first law is the law of inertia, which basically just means that objects are going to keep doing what they're doing. If they're sitting still, they're going to stay sitting still. If they're moving, they're going to keep moving. Again, that one's kind of the, the little bit more of a challenge to think about because you and I that have grown up on Earth, um, where friction is always at work no matter what, even on ice, you know, if I push something, it doesn't seem like it sort of wants, so to speak, to, to stay in, in motion because force of friction is always there and it's always going to slow it down. But if we were like from a vantage point, we were like outside of the universe looking in, we would see that there's actually quite a bit of objects. Uh, we just happen to call them planets and stars that um, stay in, in motion with nothing keeping them in motion. They're, there was something that got them in motion to begin with and they are continuing to do their, their own thing just based on how much mass they have. They've got a lot of inertia and they're going to keep doing what they're doing. All right, and then that brings us up to Newton's second law. Remember, Newton's second law is pretty much best uh, explained as a formula, right? If I apply some sort of force to a mass, I'm going to end up getting some acceleration out of the deal. Uh, so that's better known as Newton's law of acceleration. And then finally, Newton's third law is like the law of paired forces. You might remember that like really dumb demo kind of joke thing at the beginning where we had a pair and there was a couple of forces on the inside. It's a law of paired forces. So if I push on something, it pushes back on me. If I pull on something, it pulls back on me. All right, forces don't act in in a vacuum, you know, on their on their own, so to speak. All right, so without uh, getting any further into other things, let's go ahead and take a look at question one here. So again, this would be just like the uh, just like the exam. The exam will say you are driving by a car to a friend's house at a constant, and it'll give you a different number, and then it'll even say the engine of the car applies a constant force to move the car down the road against the. Uh, friction of the pavement. So it will be identical. The only thing different will be the numbers. All right. So drawing the free body diagram here, um, and even these subparts will be identical, um, is hopefully fairly straightforward. At this point, we know that we're dealing with a car. And I'll go with one of my terrible drawings here. I will be impressed if anybody can draw a car worse than me. All right. And it's on our on our surface here. Grab a different color here for some of our forces. So we know for sure, even though it doesn't tell us that gravity is acting on this car, there's definitely gravity acting on it, right? The force of gravity is going to be pulling down. Um, remember, if we were to leave the free body diagram as it is right now, that means that we've only got one force. This will be our net force. So in other words, the, the car would be accelerating through the through the road. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There must be another force acting on it here. And Newton's third law would tell us that there, there of course, is a, a paired force here. And that would be the normal force pushing up because we're not we're not assuming, you know, that the, the car is bouncing off the road or going through the, the road. So we're assuming that the force of gravity and the normal force, they're going to be the same in their magnitude. And we would want to represent that these arrows are the same in their magnitude. We wouldn't want one of them to be like shorter than the other because then it would show that we're, we're accelerating in one direction. All right, and then the other thing here, um, of course, is that if the car's moving forward, there might not be a force there um, to, to keep it in motion, but in this case, there does have to be a, uh, a force present because we have against the friction of the pavement. So we've got the force of friction that's gonna be here. So in other words, there must be a force to keep this thing at a constant velocity. In order to stay at a constant velocity, we don't need any forces present. Um, objects can continue uh, going in the direction that they are, going at the, uh, the rate of speed that they are without any sort of forces. But again, on Earth, we've got the force of friction, so there's gotta be, um, there has to be some sort of force keeping this thing in motion. All right, so we don't know which direction the car is going, uh, especially with my, my drawing here. So I'm just going to say it's going to the right, but going to the, the, the left would be equally correct. Um, and the thing that's going to keep it in, uh, in motion is our applied force. And since we are going at a constant 30 meters a second, this constant is like really, really key. It means that our forces are going to be balanced. Our applied force and whatever the other force over here, which just happens to be friction in this case, they're going to be the same in their magnitude. If the applied force was larger than our force of friction, then that would mean that we're accelerating. If our force of friction was larger than the applied force, then it would mean that we were slowing down. 
Um, not that we were moving backwards, but that we were that we were slowing down. Since both of them are approximately equal, I guess kind of my force of friction looks like it might be a little bit bigger, but I'm not going to be super picky with it. Um, so hopefully you don't uh, you're, you're not looking at, at that as like it's a it's a larger arrow. These are both the same. They should be the same. Um, so this would be a an object with zero newton net force. And a zero newton net force, of course, means that we're going to have no acceleration, which matches exactly with the scenario. Uh, we've got a, a constant velocity here. All right. So in terms of the explaining Newton's laws, describing in detail how this scenario relates to at least one of Newton's three laws, you can pick any of the three laws that you want. Uh, so you, we could say that you know the the object in this case um, is a uh, it it has some sort of mass associated with it. Newton's first law would tell us that um, the object wants to continue doing what it's doing until acted upon by an external force. So this car would want to sit still. In order to get it moving, we've got to have an applied force. So the applied force is the external force that's overcoming the inertia of the car. I could explain that. Newton's uh, second law, you know, the law of acceleration. If, if I wanted to get this car to speed up, even though that's not what it's doing in this scenario, I could say, well, if I wanted to get the car to, to speed up, I would um, apply a net force, so in other words, I would have a, a, a larger force of acceleration or a larger force of friction, and that would give me a net force that's not zero, so the car would speed up or, or slow down. Um, you could explain that. You could also say that the reason that we have a net force of, of zero newtons is because, even though I don't know my mass, at least not yet, I might find it out later, um, even though I don't know my mass, my force is going to be zero uh, zero newtons, so that must mean then, if I were solving for a here, that we'd end up with a equals zero over m, so zero divided by anything is going to be zero. So the reason that we have no acceleration is because we have no net force, which again relates to Newton's second law, since Newton's second law really is f equals ma. All right, Newton's third law here. Kind of explained it before, and I won't do this with every single one of them, but I'm just going to show you at least for the first one um, what we're looking for with um, with Newton's law. So we could look at this as um, you know the force of gravity is is pulling this car down. Well, since it's on a surface, it's not going through that surface. There must be another force acting up, and that would be, of course, the uh, the normal force. You know, the other thing that we could say for a law of paired forces or Newton's third law is that we've got an applied force going in the, uh, in the, in the forwards direction. I guess forwards direction would be this way. Um, so there is going to be another force that's acting in the reverse direction. That's the force of, of friction. So since forces always come in pairs, we've got to have those, those paired forces that we're talking about in some, some way or another. All right. So again, and there's a whole bunch of other ones that you, you could potentially take a look at as well. Those are just ones that um, I kind of thought of off the top of my head right now. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this calculation portion here. Um, it wants me to calculate the um, something here, right? Uh, there, some, there's going to be some sort of scenario. And again, this scenario is going to be the same as what's on the exam. So it'll say if a car has a mass of, give you a different uh, mass. It'll say and applies a force of, it'll give you a different force. To move forward, what are the magnitudes of the other forces acting on the car? So everything will be the same with the exception of the numbers. So if you feel comfortable with this, you're golden. All right. So it, it may uh, behoove you to look at your free body diagram as you do this. Or you could, you know, re, uh, redraw a free body diagram. Totally up to you how you want to deal with this. I'm going to redraw it real quick just because uh, so we don't have to keep scrolling back and forth here. And it's probably going to be a little bit too small on the iPad screen if I, uh, if I zoom out any further. So we already know. That the free body diagram looked something like this. We have a car. We had the surface. Should be a level surface, but you know my drawings. Force of gravity, we've got the normal force. We have the applied force moving this thing forward. And we have the force of friction that is, uh, is holding it back. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. Um, so it does tell us that we've got a mass of 1,400 kilograms which means that's going to give me my, my force, right? Newton's second law would say, let me go ahead and put this in a different color here so we can kind of keep everything separated here. This 1,400 kilograms is going to be 
the thing that gives me my force of gravity, or we could say the force of weight or weight in general. Using Newton's second law, I know the mass is 1400. Again, I'm getting that number right from, right from there. Um, and then the A, it doesn't tell me my A, but we of course know what it is, right? It is negative 10 meters per second squared. Again, because we because we know that gravity on Earth is always negative 10 meters per second squared uh, when we round it off. All right, so then that would give me a force of gravity of whatever 1400 times negative 10 is. And again, kind of resist the urge to crack out the calculator right away um, because we, we want to practice mental math as much as possible, especially with SAT coming up in the dreaded non-calculator portion. All right, so 1400 times negative 10 would give me uh, same thing as 14 times 1, negative, uh, negative 1, I guess I should say, and 1, 2, 3 zeros afterwards. So 1, 2, 3 zeros afterwards, and that would be in, in Newtons. And we wouldn't have to report this number as negative 14,000 because the negative just means that we're going in the downwards direction, not that we're truly below zero. So since we've already got an arrow over here that's pointing in the, in the downwards direction, I don't have to have that pointing in the downward direction and also say that my force of gravity is you know, negative something. I can just leave it as it's 14,000 newtons here. I don't have any sort of math that will give me my, my normal force, but we know that if our car is not going through the road, then there must be a zero newton net force vertically. So that must mean then that my normal force is also going to be 14,000 newtons and then it already tells me what my applied force is right? it tells me that it applies a force the engine applies a force of 5,000 newtons and if we went up back to the uh, the top it would tell us that the car is going at a constant I believe it said uh, 30 meters a second in this problem right it's going at a constant 30 meters per second that 30 meters per second actually is extraneous information we we don't need it um, it's just giving us a hint that we're, we're not changing our, our speed at all. So if we're not changing our speed, we have a zero Newton net force again, kind of like we talked about over here, which then means that my force of friction will also be 5,000 Newtons. Right? 5,000 minus 5,000 gives me a net force of zero in the horizontal direction, in the vertical direction, we would also end up with a net force of zero as well, because 14,000 minus 14,000 will give us zero. So in the end, you could leave it as a, a free body diagram like this. Um, you could label the uh, you could label your forces with numbers that we just solved for up at the top, and just say C above or something like that, or you could list them out and say you know that we know the the normal force, the force of gravity, force of friction and the applied force equal you know what they what they equal in this case this was 14,000 and again you want to make sure that you're always dealing with your units force of friction is 5,000 and our applied force is 5,000 newtons as well and that would be our final answer either listed out final answer on the free body diagram here and the free body diagram above uh, either way, but then also make sure that you're you're showing your work along the way too, so we we can see where your where your thought process is coming from. All right, so hopefully that feels pretty comfortable for you. Um, again, the first question on the test will be exactly like this, just with some different values. And I'll I'll be honest, the the forces are even going to be really similar. So it might be that one version of the exam, there's four versions, will have four thousand newtons. Another one might say seven thousand newtons. So we're not going to even throw numbers at you that are totally um, totally different than this by any means, okay? Um, so this one will go a little bit quicker because we reviewed all of Newton's laws already. We've drawn free body diagrams already, so let's go ahead and get into it. So we have the skydiver that's got a mass of 57 kilograms and it says has just opened her parachute and she's, she's slowing down here. Um, so this slowing down is, it is going to, to matter for us. So let's go ahead and draw this out here. So uh, you could draw the object as, as just a box. You could draw it as a, um, you know, a person. I'll draw it as like a little stick figure or something like that. Uh, but it's, it's totally up to you. So we do see that our, our skydiver has a parachute. That's kind of a bonus when you're skydiving. 
Um, so I got my parachute there. It does tell us that we are slowing down. So that, that matters with my, the magnitude of my forces. Um, I'm actually going to not label my, my skydiver here. I'm just going to draw my arrows just a little bit next to the skydiver so that I can kind of separate it from the, the sticks on our, di on our uh, diagram there. But the force of gravity we know is, 50, uh, is 57 kilograms times 10, which would give us 570 newtons. You don't have to label that even, um, as long as we, we know that the force of gravity is pulling down. And it says that we're slowing down. So this slowing down, uh, like I said, matters quite a bit. So that will tell us that our force of friction is greater than our force of gravity. So we would just want to make sure that our force of friction, that particular um, vector, is larger than the force of gravity. Um, or you could call this the force of drag um, or the force of air resistance. So any one of those I would be perfectly fine with as long as we realize that it's a, a force that is resisting um, the, the force of gravity. All right, and we're just going to assume that this para uh, parachutist is going straight down. I guess the skydiver is going straight down, so we don't have to worry about forces in the um, in the x direction. Um, if you did have something, it might be like the force from the wind pushing one way, and then an equal amount of drag going the other way. But that is more than more than necessary. All right. So then for Newton's laws, again, there's a whole bunch of different things you could describe any one of them. Something to do with inertia. You know, this skydiver is is falling, and they're going to continue to continue to fall without any sort of um, forces present. Of course, we do have forces present, though, so you could talk about Newton's second law. You know, our skydiver here, we already know it. The force of friction is larger. The force of air resistance is larger than the force of gravity. So that means that we are going to have a net force. You know, F uh, F net equals m a. So in this case, our our mass will have an acceleration, but the, the acceleration will be negative because I'm going to have a negative negative net force. We're assuming that going downwards is actually positive in this case since that's what the object's going to be doing and the thing that's going to be resisting it is, is air resistance. Um, if you wanted to reverse your positive and negative, that's that's fine too as long as uh, you're able to explain the, the scenario. All right, And then, of course, Newton's third law would be that our object, in this case uh, the person, is going downwards with gravity, so there's going to be another force pushing back up because of the, the air, so it's paired forces there. All right, so let's go ahead and calculate this now. It does ask us um, to calculate something about our skydiver's um, parachute after it's been fully opened. So after the skydiver's parachute has fully opened, the force of air resistance on her parachute is 600 newtons. What acceleration does the skydiver now experience? And again, make sure to show your work. Uh, make sure to show those units so that we can give you full credit. All right, um, so let's see here. Force of air resistance on her parachute is, is 600 newtons. And I'm, again, going to go ahead and redraw our, our free body diagram here just so I'm not scrolling back and forth. All right, hanging on to that parachute there. And um, we know that our force of air resistance is 600 newtons. Maybe I'll go ahead and switch over colors just to make sure that we know exactly where these numbers are coming from. So our air resistance is 600 newtons. I already know that my air resistance is larger than my force of gravity because, again, we are slowing down. So my force of gravity is going to be less. And the proportion between the two, the ratio of length between our two forces, doesn't matter as long as you're showing that you clearly understand that the force of gravity is less than the force of air resistance. And we'd have to scroll back up to see, well, what's the, what's the mass here in order to figure out what, um, what this downwards force is going to be? And we saw before that this is, uh, our, our person is 57 kilograms. So then that means our force of gravity here is going to be 570, right? Because 
57 kilograms for our mass, and we have negative 10 for our acceleration. The negative is just representing that this is a downwards force, which we have uh, represented already by the downwards arrow here. So we could just leave this as 570 um, newtons there. So for some, it seems like we're kind of done at this point, but we're not, right? Because it does ask us, what's the acceleration of our, um, of our skydiver here? So we just solved for the force of gravity, and we already knew what the force of friction was, but now we can figure out what our, what our um, acceleration is by looking at our net force. So our net force would be all of our other forces combined, right? So the, the force of air resistance plus the force of gravity. So we know the force of uh, air resistance is 600. Force of gravity is 570. So we are going down. So this 600, we're actually going to represent as a, as a negative 600 because that's our resisting force. So our resisting force generally is the one that gets the, the negative. So then I'd be able to say, well, my net force is negative 30 then. And again, we're still not done yet. We just figured out what our, what our net force is. Now we're going to end up figuring out what our acceleration is overall. All right, so we know to figure out acceleration, we need to use Newton's second law, which is uh, our net force is equivalent to mass times an acceleration. We could also rearrange this if we wanted to as well and say an acceleration is equal to a, a net force applied over a over a mass. In class we've really been using the formula in, in this um, format, so I'll continue with that just to be consistent, but A equals um, F net over M might actually be a little bit better in this case since we are solving for acceleration. We don't have to bump our variables around later. But um, again, we already know our net force. I'm getting this number right from up there. Um, we know what our mass is. Again, that's from up uh, up top or over here same mass our skydiver of course wouldn't have changed mass at all while they were while they were skydiving while they were skydiving I should say and then we can go ahead and solve for what our acceleration is so in order to get a by itself let's get rid of anything else that's associated with it 57 times a um, would have to, we'd have to get rid of that 57 by dividing do the opposite right and if we do it to one side, of course, do it to the other side. So I'm hoping that you're not in the uh, habit of looking at those numbers and going, well, do I? what do I do to 30 and 57? Really, we don't care about 30 at all. We care about A. How do I get A by itself? Divide by 57. It just so happens that I have to do it to the other side. So it tells my math tells me you got to divide negative, negative 30 by uh, 57. So I'd end up with A equals whatever negative 30 divided by 57 is. Uh, 30 over 60 would be half-ish, right? So I know it's going to be somewhere somewhere around there. Let's go ahead and see what that uh, what that would be. 30 divided by 57 would give me 0.5263, like all this stuff. You could leave it at 0.5. Uh, 0.53 would both uh, would both be fine. And it is a negative number. I just didn't show it on the calculator because we're dividing a negative number by a positive number. We're going to end up with a negative, and since it's acceleration, it's going to be in meters per second squared. So that right there is my final answer. Bunch of work to get to it, but um, manageable in the end, hopefully. All right. So on to the last one here. Hopefully you're hanging in there still. So question three. We've got this airplane. It's flying through the air, and it's accelerating up to its maximum speed of 260 meters a second against the force of air resistance. So let's see what our free body diagram would look like here. Uh, I've got my, my airplane. This is about as good as they get for me. I'm actually impressed with myself on that one. Um, for everybody else, it's probably like that is the worst plane ever. But uh, we know that it is flying through the air and it is accelerating. So that, uh, that accelerating piece there is key. So we know in our forwards direction, the engine that's applying the force, that force is going to be greater than the, uh, than the drag that we're going to be um, 
experiencing or the air resistance that we're going to be experiencing. So our force of drag or force of air resistance would be opposite the applied force because there's going to be air molecules that are acting upon this plane, causing it to slow down, basically creating friction. We just generally don't call it friction because it's going through a gas and it's not against a solid surface, but, it, but essentially it's, a, it's the same thing. So we just want to make it really obvious that our arrow or our vector in the forwards direction is going to be larger than in the reverse. Um, and then since it's a, an airplane, it's not going to just be sort of <laughs> sitting uh, vertically, it, it's going to end up falling. So there must be something that's that's holding it back up. Um, I'll switch colors to make that a little bit more clear here so we know that there is going to be force of gravity acting on this, but it doesn't tell us that it's landing or that it's you know taking off. So we wouldn't say that it's going down or going up. We're just going to assume that it's flying level. So that means my force in the upwards direction, whatever it is, is going to end up being the same as my, my force of gravity in, in value. All right, and we would say in the upwards direction, we'd call that the force of lift, because um, air is going to be lifting that plane up as it, uh, as it flies through the air and gets caught underneath the wings. All right, um, explain Newton's three laws. I'll let you kind of figure that out again. Newton's first law, second law, third law. doesn't matter which one you want to explain. Uh, be thinking of some of them. All right, so now let's go ahead and take a look at our calculations. Last question here. Um, and I'm getting tired. It's like 1 o'clock in the morning right now for me. That's the only time my dogs are asleep and my kids are asleep. Um, so the airplane produces 60, sorry, 6,500,000 newtons of applied force from its engines if it's accelerating at a constant rate of 4 meters a second squared while overcoming 5,100,000 really newtons of air resistance. What's the mass of this plane? Um, and again, show your work, show your units. Um, and the, the other nice thing, aside from me being able to see your thought process, is if you mess up a little bit and you show your work, I can, I can still give you a lot of credit because I can see sort of where you're going. If you just put down the answer and nothing else, then if you get it wrong, you get the whole problem wrong, which would be a shame. All right, so we've got our airplane. And again, on the actual exam, you could just label it uh, label it above if you want. Um, but I'll draw it out just so we're not flipping back and forth here. It tells us that we have an applied force of 6,500,000. So we haven't really been dealing with forces that large, but it makes sense, you know, that this is this is an airplane, so there's going to be a heck of a lot of force coming from those engines and I'm actually going to draw that a little bit larger just to make it really obvious that this is our largest force here. All right, so my applied force is 6,500,000 newtons. Um, it is accelerating at a constant 4 meters per second squared. Well, that, that 4 meters per second squared isn't going to go on my free body diagram anywhere because it is not a force, it's an acceleration. So we'll see where that comes into play in a little bit. But it does say we are overcoming a uh, 5,100,000 newton force of air resistance. So we would have our air resistance, kind of a poor choice of color there on my part since that's what our diagram is. But our force of air resistance or force of air is 5,100,000 newtons. All right, and of course we've still got the the force of gravity going in the downwards direction, um, the force of lift going in the upwards direction. Uh, we don't really have to focus on that though, because we're assuming that the two are going to cancel one another out. Um, so we don't have to we don't have to deal with them since they're in equal but opposite directions. All right, so to figure out our mass, hopefully you realize well our uh, great way to do that is to use Newton's second law. Our net force is equal to our mass times acceleration. Um, our mass, we don't know. Our acceleration, we do. And that's 4 meters per second squared. And by the way, that's actually the same as the acceleration on every single version of the exam. Our uh, net force, 
would be 6,500,000 minus 5,100,000. So we would, we would expect our net force to be positive because we are accelerating, right? It's, it's accelerating. If it were slowing down, it would be negatively um, accelerating, at least generally. All right, so 6,500,000. Minus five million one hundred thousand gives me a whole bunch of zeros here. One point four million or one million four hundred thousand. And then again, hopefully you're not asking yourself like do I divide these two numbers or multiply them? In the end, let your uh, let your math tell you what to do. Right, so we know that we've got uh, m being multiplied by 4, so we want to do the opposite to get rid of that 4. And of course, if I do it to one side, we got to do it to the other side as, as well. Uh, 16 divided by 4 would be 4, right? So 16 uh, or 1,600,000 would be somewhere around 400,000. This isn't uh, isn't 16; it's 14. So it's actually going to be a little bit a little bit less than that. Get my calculator back up there. The only reason I talk about that is again to specify the importance of of mental math. Um, so I actually do 14 divided by 4, and that gives me 3.5. So really, it is didn't take into account all the zeros. It would be 3 million, or sorry, 350. Thousand, and that would be in kilograms, and that is our final answer. Right? That is the weight of the plane. Um, and if they kind of wigged you out a little bit that I didn't throw the zeros in there, we could do that. All right, divided by four gives us exactly what we said: three hundred and fifty thousand kilograms. All right, so I hope you do a wonderful job on the exam. Go through this again if you feel like you need to. Um, but I hope that uh, you, you feel like you're really, really successful on this one. All right, have a good one.